Libertarians understand better than most that history is something built from the bottom up, from the innumerable and largely unnoticed stream of individual choices, actions, and events. Yet even we have a tendency to fall for mythological history from above when it suits our own values or interests. For decades, Sheldon Richman has been a staple of modern libertarianism. His work builds on a long tradition of libertarianism from below, which, while it may emphasize the lives, works, and interests of great men from time to time, decidedly shows that politicians do not build societies. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. So plenty of historians have kind of said that the Articles of Confederation were the logical outcome of the Revolutionary War. Uh, the ideas that went into it, the kind of activism that fueled it, uh, and the political coalition that actually made it happen, that naturally, uh, logically, those people would create the kind of government that they did during the 1780s. Can you explain this for us and break it down a bit? Uh, that would be the dominant view, but it's not the unanimous view. Uh, one of the eminent historians of uh, this whole period is Merrill Jensen, who uh, points out that the men who wrote the Constitution were very different, were a very different group of men from those who wrote the Declaration of Independence, and this sort of theme is also picked up by the uh, historian of uh, this period, Gordon Wood, who uh, virtually describes the movement toward the Constitution and the uh, ratification as a counter-revolution. That there were, the revolution was was radical. But the, uh, the, the movement that uh, led, led to the Constitution was actually conservative, not radical. So w in, in what regard then was the revolution radical in your view? If, if there was a counter-revolution later, there must have actually been something revolutionary about the revolution. So what really was that? Well, I agree with Wood and other historians who, who uh, take this perspective that the re revolution was in fact uh, radical in the sense – that uh, not only was it breaking away from uh, uh, this uh, dominant empire, the British Empire, but that it was in a, in a very real sense an egalitarian revolution. By egalitarian, I don't mean economically egalitarian, you know, where everyone has the same income uh, and uh, you know measures of that uh, nature, but rather it was anti-aristocratic. The British were seen as an aristocracy, but not just the British. The, uh, the individual colonies had their own homegrown aristocracies, which uh, fed off the privileges of, uh, of, the, of the crown, of course, the British crown. But uh, they had uh, a more or less rigid uh, aristocratic structure, and that the constitution, uh, the uh, revolution was really, uh, Jensen puts it this way, uh, so does Wood, as, a, as both an internal and external revolution. Not only was it aimed at uh, throwing off British rule, it was aimed at throwing off homegrown aristocratic rule. and. Uh, and that's what was ushered into the states, the new states, after, after the uh, victory over Britain in the revolution. That's the counter-revolution. There's a, then a, a reaction to this uh, egalitarianism, and we might call it the democ radical democracy, although there's a lot of misconceptions about that. The, uh, but the, the movement to centralize power uh, uh, that uh, you know, came to fruition in Philadelphia in, in 1787 and then 1789 uh, <clears throat> was a, a reaction against this uh, egalitarianism. So let's dig into that egalitarianism a little bit because I think a lot of libertarians today attend, would be very skeptical about some of the liberties that uh, revolutionaries thought they were protecting or expanding upon like uh, paper money, for example, the, the liberty to print their own paper money in the colonies. Well, you know, we're, we're no friends of paper money today, generally speaking. Um, or the freedom to restrict trade at the local or, you know, colonial state level. Uh, so how do, how, what do we do with that then? Yeah, these are fascinating issues. And of course, they're, they're complicated. And I want to stress at the beginning 
that the uh, the, the two large uh, groups that we talk about, uh, uh, the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists, uh, uh, that by definition, or by nature, is a, is, a, is a gross oversimplification, of course. History is always complicated, and the dangers always lie in trying to simplify. I mean, you've got to do it, but you've got to be careful when you do it. Uh, the Federalists were not m monolithic, and the Anti-Federalists were even less, even less monolithic than the Federalists were. There was a huge range of views. So uh, I uh, plead guilty right at the start to oversimplifying, and plenty of people could come up with counterexamples and say, but so-and-so said this, and so uh, I, that, that's just uh, in the nature of, of the beast. Uh, but talking about the two issues you raised, which was uh, money and trade, uh, let's take trade first, because uh, the huge misconceptions about trade. Uh, one of the, the big defenses of the Constitution that libertarians uh, uh, also uh, uh, will invoke is that uh, the, co the Constitution, that some people might say, in effect, created simply created a free trade zone among the 13 states. And, uh, and, and this accounts for you know, economic growth and, uh, and lots of good things. Well, of course, we're for free trade, and uh, libertarians would want the whole world to be a free trade zone. But the misconception there is brought up by Jensen and others is that the, uh, is that the uh, period under the Articles of Confederation was uh, a free trade zone. It's just a myth that states were uh, er erecting trade barriers uh, uh, to each other uh, in this period. Now, now uh, the one exception, which is minor, is that I think uh, one or two of the states would put up would would demand duties on say European goods that came into New Jersey and then passed into New York. I mean they had duties against uh, European goods. Uh, you know they weren't uh, Adam Smith uh, free traders uh, on either they, were, they weren't free traders on either side pure free traders. Uh, so uh, New Jersey or New York might might demand uh, the duty that they would have gotten on European goods had they come directly into uh, into New York. So if they came through New Jersey. They, uh, they would impose a duty. But that was, uh, I believe, the exception, and it was minor. What you didn't have were duties against New Jersey goods coming into, say, New York. So it, there was a free trade zone. And one of the proofs of this uh, is that uh, in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton, in arguing for, of course, the Federalist Papers were what? They were, they were uh, sales pitches. Right to the ratification uh, conventions in the states, sales pitches on behalf of ratification of the Constitution. He argued that if the if the Constitution were to be ratified, the the level of tariffs could be tripled against the outside world. In other words, there weren't the tariffs weren't high enough, and you can see why they wouldn't be because the states were in a basically in a competitive uh, posture against one another, and that might have the effect of driving down tariffs in a, in a way to bid. To, to get goods into into the states from uh, into their respective states from uh, from Europe and elsewhere. So you know, here's Hamilton saying, we can't be protectionist enough under the Articles. We need a central power to set trade policy, which is one of the very big motives for centralizing power to to be able to enact a national trade policy. That's not something that should thrill libertarians. Uh, on paper money, well, of course. Uh, the, the federal, the national government didn't exactly end the problem of paper money, did it? I need not say that to libertarians today. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking of Ron Paul's campaigns of end the Fed, you know, with his uh, chance of end the Fed. So, uh, uh, and, and and even the Constitution itself didn't end paper money because although the states were forbidden to uh, to emit paper money on their own, they were allowed to charter banks that emitted paper money, and pay, the the country was awash in paper money in the 19th century, in the early 19th century especially. Uh, and the Americans liked paper money. One of the myths is that Americans didn't like paper money. Well, if you can read uh, history, financial histories of the United States by various people. My, I have uh, my, uh, my book on the Constitution, America's Counter Revolution, discusses this in some detail. Uh, uh, there was lots of paper money. Americans didn't dislike paper money. And in 1818, uh, Alfred Baring of, of the famous uh, financial family in England, Baring, uh, uh, the Baring family, uh, uh, was speaking to some uh, government uh, commission, and he said, you know, there's more paper money in the United States uh, than uh, in any other country on earth. So Americans were not averse to paper money. Now, paper money is problematic, as you said, huge, huge problems. The uh, the national government during the during the uh, the confeder uh, confederation government during the uh, uh, the war. Uh, issue Continentals, 
And that was a disaster. And of course, we have the famous phrase that comes out of that, uh, not worth the continental. So, uh, so that's one thing. And states themselves did I issue money uh, for various uh, purposes. Uh, but some did, some, uh, sometimes they ran into problems, but other times they didn't. For some reason, they were, uh, I don't know, you know, the reasons, but they, it was a moderate issuance of, of money and it didn't lead to huge uh, uh, depreciation and economic upheaval. Uh, they just were, were careful about it, which is not an endorsement of a paper money regime, but it just shows it's not an automatic disaster. Now, one of the things the paper money did in those days, in the Confederation period, was it functioned uh, in lieu of taxation. And if we and uh, critics of inflation, libertarians among them, uh, often point out that uh, that uh, inflation is a is an implicit form of taxation, right? Because it transfers purchasing power from people, the people to uh, the politicians, right? If you issue money, the money depreciates. People can buy less, but the government can take that new money and buy things. So there's a transfer of purchasing power. Well, taxation is a transfer of pur purchasing power, right? You hand, you hand your money over to the government, you lost the purchasing power, and the government now has the purchasing power. So uh, as I say, inflation is, a, is an implicit form of taxation. That actually didn't work out so badly in many state in many cases in the states, the ones that were more moderate, because people found that preferable, that form of paying taxes preferable to an armed tax man coming to your farm and confiscating uh, your goods, your crops, your horses, whatever, it, because you didn't pay you didn't pay your taxes. They actually preferred that. Plus, as a way of uh, mitigating the uh, depreci depreciation effects. Uh, it was easy for farmers to evade cash altogether. You, you know, most people, of course, were farmers, and you could uh, you could stay out of the cash economy if you wanted to. You could barter with neighbors for with crops and, and things like that. So that had a way of tamping it down. So it wasn't. We shouldn't throw the word paper money around just to scare people. I mean, I'm, I'm against un, uh, government uh, government uh, currency. Uh, I'm for free money. I'm for hard, I'm for uh, no, I won't even say hard money. I'm for market-based money, which may be hard and may not be hard. Maybe Bitcoin, for all I know. But uh, but the point is that wasn't an automatic disaster, and it actually had some uh, benefits given the choices available at the time. So, can you tell us a bit about the Articles of Confederation then, and what exactly uh, were some of the key provisions? Who put them in place? Yeah, and what well, interests first, did the Articles protect? During the colonial period, there were two continental congresses, which uh, Britain, I guess, uh, overlooked or the king didn't care about, or I'm not really sure what his attitude is, but the states uh, sent uh, uh, representatives to the continental congress. If you've seen the movie uh, 1776, which is about the writing of the Declaration of Independence, that whole movie takes place inside the Second Continental Congress. It was it was that it was that Congress that declared independence and uh, authorized a committee uh, inc that included uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, Benjamin Franklin to write the Declaration of Independence. At the same time, there was a committee writing uh, Articles of Confederation, looking ahead to when uh, Britain was uh, no longer ruling the colonies. The colonies were then sovereign states, which is what would would then be sovereign states, which is how uh, pe most people saw it. And, but they'd be in a confederation, uh, in other words, a club, a, uh, a, I think they actually called it a perpetual union, uh, that would not handle, not have uh, any jurisdiction over the internal affairs of the sovereign states, but would have jurisdiction over external affairs uh, that the states, you know, were getting together to handle, thinking that individually they couldn't handle them, mainly foreign relations and things of that sort. Uh, it had one branch of government. It had Congress. And the Congress elected a president uh, who, who presided over the Congress. So it was, the, and his title was President of the United States in Congress Assembled. Uh, the first president was a guy named, uh, um, oh gosh, Samuel Huntington. Uh, we sometimes, uh, historians debate over should, who should really be considered the first, because Huntington, Huntington's two-year term uh, straddled the pre-articles period and the post-articles period, so some people don't count him. And then uh, the second guy, Richard Henry Lee, I believe, became uh, left uh, early to become uh, governor of Virginia, I think it is. And then, uh, so John Hansen is sometimes considered the first president under the articles because he served the full term fully within the, the period of the articles. Uh, so 
technically we could say he was the first president of the United States, and that was his title, uh, not George Washington. But of course, he didn't have the PR that George Washington had. He didn't have wooden tea. He didn't chop down a cherry tree when he was a kid. So people forget him. But uh, uh, so anyway, we have a president who's a member of Congress, sort of like a prime minister in that sense. A, uh, you could call it a parliamentary system. It had term limits. You couldn't serve uh, more than, uh, I don't know, three out of six years, stuff like that. There was no separate executive. There was no separate judiciary. It was basically a one branch. Uh, government. Uh, importantly, I, I use the term government, but maybe we should properly call it a quasi-government because it lacked certain key powers, which all governments have. I think it's part, uh, at least one of them is part of the definition of government. There was no power to tax. And I think that qualifies it, therefore, as a quasi-government. Now, why was it a government at all? Because its money came from taxation, but it was taxation levied by the states. So it was a, it was a second order a second order of tax, taxing power, let's say. They could requisition money from the states. They could basically ask for money. And the states sometimes, you know, uh, delayed or said, them, you know, the check is in the mail or something like that. Um, they didn't always come up with the money when they needed it. So this, this government could not directly tax people. Was there any central authority to compel a state to act on anything? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I don't really think there was a, 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 a formal authority to com to compel. There was lots of discussion about that, and lots of discussion in during the, uh, the in this Confederation Congress about giving the con giving Congress some independent power to tax. Uh, the most popular proposal was a five percent tariff, uh, which relates to my other point. There was no power to regulate trade. These are two very important powers, and the third law I might as well add right here. To raise, it couldn't raise an army. It had to go to the states to get people, men for the army. So imagine a government that could not tax, could not regulate or promote trade, and could not raise an army. That sounds like that's my kind of government. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's more than I, it's more than I want. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but it's, sure. But but I, I take that as a first step. So that ought to be of great interest to libertarians that this this quote government uh, lack these three powers. The proposals to give Congress a uh, an independent uh, tariff. Uh, failed a couple times. There was an amendment to, to the articles that had to be unanimously accepted by the 13 uh, states. And uh, one state or another, Rhode Island, I think, uh, comes to mind, uh, would block it uh, on the two occasions. And this gets the nationalists thinking, the people that wanted America to be a, a, a great nation, uh, and, uh, you know, and I say that intentionally because not only do they use the word, but these days with, uh, with Trump, it's, it's a relevant phrase, right? They wanted, they wanted to make America great. Not again, because it wasn't great yet, but they wanted to make it. They were wearing baseball caps that said, make America great. Okay, just MAG, not MAGA. Uh, the, this gets them thinking, look, we can't live with the uh, Articles of Confederation. You know, 14 days, less than two weeks, actually, into the period of the Articles, 14 days after it had been gone into effect, uh, James Madison, who was a member of the Second Continental Congress, is looking for ways to expand the power under the Articles. He tried. He tried to use the treaty power. He they tested various things. He couldn't get anywhere. Just did not give them anything to work with. It was trying. It was like grabbing at uh, a cloud. There just wasn't anything to get your teeth into. And this is what begins to give thought to, uh, you know, give people thoughts that maybe we need to get together and come up with a new plan for the government. And that's. Various events push things in, the, in that direction, and that's, of course, what happened. Well, now that's my next question because it, it seems that seen in this light, this decade or so is a very, very special time in, in history where these sort of sister nation states are all peacefully cooperating with one another for their mutual benefit under a central organization with no compulsory powers uh, or at least that, that – can't use them easily, whatever powers there may be hidden in there. And there is <laughs> what some may characterize as a conspiracy and coup d'etat cooked up over the course of the decade to overthrow yep. this government and replace it with one of their own creation. So who, who well, were these yep. people? Well, they're, they're names that are well known to us. There's, there's uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, uh, Madison, uh, uh, Madison uh, is a little bit ambivalent, but he's in Hamilton's camp uh, almost fully at this stage. Later on, he becomes more Jeffersonian. He's a friend of Jefferson's, and there's a lot of correspondence 
with Jefferson, who's uh, you know, suspicious of this. Uh, we have the two Morrises. We have uh, Robert Morris and Gouverneur Morris, who were finan uh, finance guys and merchants and very influential. Gouverneur Morris was made like superintendent of finance during the uh, Confederation Congress and uh, and one at a central bank, basically, basically the, the Hamilton program or later the Henry Clay America uh, system, a central bank, permanent debt, standing army. They wanted all these things. They're pushing. They were pushing for these things, and uh, and and so they. There was a lot of intrigue. The the Morrises were trying to get uh, the uh, the uh, officers, the revolutionary officers, uh, interested in uh, putting pressure on uh, on Congress to uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, well, basically set up this uh, constitutional convention so they could move toward uh, toward greater uh, power. The promise being. Uh, you know your pensions. You'll you'll have your pensions uh, paid in full. They tried to enlist various interests to uh, push for uh, uh, for centralization. There was this near coup in uh, Newburgh, New York, that uh, Washington famously uh, uh, quashed by uh, pointing out that he had basically gone blind in the, you know in the uh, in the revolution and made this great sacrifice. So please don't don't do this. Uh, he was afraid that there'd be some military coup. But they were, and then the 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 creditors, the people that were owed money from the states uh, because of the war, they had uh, they had lent money, you know, uh, or uh, or produced goods and gave the goods to the government to, to prosecute the war, uh, were were owed money, and the centralizers would go to them and say, you have a, you'll have a better uh, chance of getting your loans repaid if we centralize power and change this this system. I mean, the states, it's a, some in some different ways, were trying to uh, pay off the debts, but uh, but uh, the centralizers would go to the creditors, and so they and and said, "You're going to do better if we centralize power. Look, we'll have a taxing power. We'll be able to promote trade. It'll be good, and 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 you'll benefit from all this." So you can see how they tried to put a coalition uh, together, and it was kind of behind the scenes. It wasn't some open thing. It was, you know, I don't want to overplay the conspiracy theory, but it, it had some whiff of conspiracy. Let's get the creditors, the officers together, and push for centralization. Uh, and then one of the crowning blows is you get Shays Rebellion in the uh, in the uh, 1780s, where uh, which is a tax revolt in Western Massachusetts because the Massachusetts uh, had a had a big war debt and really jacked up taxes on the farmers, and it was uh, crushing. And farmers and uh, when they paid their taxes, they couldn't pay their mortgages, so there were foreclosures going on, and this created. Uh, a little rebellion, right? Shays led a uh, <coughs> led a uh, a movement that shut down the courts to to stop uh, the evictions from the farms. This is used to be interpreted as a class struggle, right? You had simply uh, debtors rebelling against creditors, but uh, more historians now understand that it was a tax rebellion. It was not a class rebellion, and the uh, the nationalists saw what was going on in Massachusetts. And and said we got to do something about this. This is dangerous. They didn't like that state legislatures were enacting, uh, were sorry, electing, uh, or the people were electing to the state legislatures, working class kind of people, not the elite. And they got very nervous. And then you see what happened as a result of Shays, a new governor is elected. It's John Hancock, by the way, uh, is elected, and they moderate the taxes on on uh, the farmers. They bow to the pressure, and that either scared the hell out of the nationalists, or they, at least they pretended to be scared. They they uh, spooked George Washington and said, you got to come to the con The convention was already being arranged at this point, and Washington wasn't sure he wanted to go. He's the most prestigious man in the country, let's uh, let's remember. And the nationalists, uh, his, his friends, people who were aides to him during the, uh, during the war, said, you have to go Look what's happening in Massachusetts. We have outright rebellion. This is going to happen. It's anarchy. It's uh, it's foreign fuel. They would talk about these are foreign agents. They scared the hell out of Washington, even though I'm not sure the people trying to scare him totally believed it themselves. And and that pushed uh, Washington over the edge, and he decided he'd come and, and then preside at the Constitutional Convention. So it was this effort to scare people into thinking this system is unstable. It's anar it's anarch anarchic. And uh, you know everything's going to go to hell unless we come up with a new plan. Now I want to I want to push back a little bit on uh, using that word conspiracy. 
Because um, as I understand his, his thinking, at least, Alexander Hamilton revered the British system for its graft and its, its uh, ability for conspiracies to thrive because that's what actually drove policy through. The coalition building, the wheeling and dealing between aristocrats at court and people in parliament and interest groups outside of the government, that's what made the whole great uh, machine turn in, in Hamilton's mind. So that's sort of what these people thought politics was all about, um, making conspiracies yeah, and maybe, following maybe through on them. It, maybe we're using conspiracy in a slightly different way. I, <laughs> I, I, I guess I was saying there, there weren't just a bunch of men in a... Uh, smoke-filled room. I guess oh no, no. George George then. Soros wasn't around yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I take your point. Uh, uh, see, the, the Hamilton and Madison and, and these others who pushed for the Constitution uh, uh, did have in mind the sort of things you're talking about. They thought <clears throat> they were. One thing Gordon Wood points out, <clears throat> excuse me, is that by the end of the, the lives of the various founders, they were all disillusioned. They thought the experiment was a failure with the country because they didn't get the civic Republican society they expected. People were too concerned about making a living, <clears throat> you know, looking after their financial interests and not uh, focused on the good, the general welfare. Uh, both sides, the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians were uh, uh, bothered by this. Hamilton's view and, 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 and Madison's view was that uh, if you have a national government and you, you, uh, you filter out the sort of hoi polloi. You get the sort of better, better type of person being a representative, which they figure would happen if you have a small legislature, you know, outside of the states, far, far from the individual uh, states. Uh, you're going to get a better class of people, and not, and not that that better, better class of people would be self-regarding. No, they would be the above the fray mediators of the various interests uh, that were competing. And using state legislatures for uh, for their advantage, and that's what they wanted. Uh, according to Gordon Wood, the Constitution was going to be a sieve; it was going to filter out undesirables because they were too easily getting into state state legislatures. You know, they really wanted to downgrade the states. We talk about how the states, you know, federalism is sort of a dead letter now, but but it was a uh, it was it was a dying letter back then. Uh, uh, Madison wanted pa the the federal government to have the power to veto state laws. Uh, John Jay said states should just become counties, as it were, as the way counties are to states. States would become counties with relation, in relation to the, the national government. They really wanted to downgrade the states. Don't forget, states, people's general political identification in those days was with the states. Patrick Henry says, Virginia is my country. The, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the peace treaty with the King of England named the individual sovereign states. It was a separate, in effect, a separate peace treaty with each of the states. <clears throat> when the Constitution is first unveiled and put out for ratification, uh, you have anti federalists you have Patrick Henry and you have Sam Adams and others saying, what's this we the people? The very first words are we the people, not we the states. They could see that a change was attempting to be effected in the country uh, by, by this shift. And of course, the ratification conventions were not the state legislatures. They were special, <coughs> excuse me, special um, conventions selected for that purpose. Now, a big part of your argument throughout the book is that uh, the the intrusiveness and parasitism of government that we're all so familiar with by now was was not accidental over time. It was actually baked into the design early on by these uh, conspirators, if you will, people like Hamilton. Um, and you juxtapose that with what you call the real constitution, the sort of average everyday practices of life and rules that govern real lived experience and real behavior uh, outside the halls of the government. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate on that idea of the real constitution and what exactly was the real constitution of the day? Well, I have a chapter at the end of my book called The Constitution of Anarchy, which uh, is also a play on Hayek's uh, constitutional liberty. <clears throat> and it's uh, it, and I'm really just reformulating uh, I think uh, some uh, valid, very valid points, important points for libertarians made by uh, Roderick Long, a philosopher, libertarian philosopher at Auburn University <clears throat> and other people, which points out that any society by definition has an implicit constitution. Because when we say society, we already are referring to the idea of order, right? Otherwise, I don't think we would call it a society. We would call it 
just, you know, mob or chaos or, you know, Hobbesian situation. Uh, society already suggests the idea of customs, mores, implicit rules, rules which might not be written down anywhere or even articulated, but just the day-to-day -day expectations that people have that most people most of the time observe. It doesn't mean that nobody mo nobody does. Of course, there are outlaws and people who, who uh, break the expectations. But by and large, if we're talking about a society, that's what we mean. That's the very idea of it. Uh, so I, I wanted to make the point that it, you don't need a written constitution to have a constitution. England, for one thing, doesn't have a written constitution. And then the, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum, the Soviet constitution said some good things, right? Didn't the Soviet constitution defend, uh, declare uh, there'd be freedom of speech and freedom of press? But of course, we know there wasn't freedom of speech and freedom of press uh, under the Soviet Union. So what's written down may not be what the real rules are. Another person who's very good at uh, spelling this out, well, Eleanor Ostrom, for example, Nobel Prize winner who uh, who talks about how uh, common pool resources uh, have, have been governed without, gover without government. And uh, James C. Scott in Seeing Like a State uh, stresses this point too. The, the real rules may not be the rules that are written on parchment or hanging in the National Archives or any formal rule. Uh, the real rules are the rules that are being observed every day by people, that form people's expectations and that people build their whole, you know, build plans around and build their lives around because they're generally observed. That's the true constitution of any uh, 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 of any society. Now, we have a constitution that sa says some things, and libertarians and others lament that the, uh, certain constitutional provisions have uh, have just sort of disappeared, although they haven't disappeared from the document. For example, Congress is supposed to have the power to declare war, but Congress has not declared war since, I think it declared war on Germany in what, 1942. So that was the last time there's been a declaration of war. Uh, other things have gone away. Uh, uh, supposedly eminent domain was only supposed to be for uh, taking property for public use, but now we, with the Kelo case from uh, the 2000s, uh, uh, we, the Supreme Court said, well, if it's private, it's for, if it's for private use, but there's going to be some public benefit, that's that's good enough. That's that satisfies it. So, first of all, constitutions uh, like uh, like laws are are never written down uh, in a final form. In other words, they're always going to be subject to interpretation, uh, and so. What's written down may not be what governs at some later time. Uh, this brings us into the subject of a living constitution. My, po my point is that constitutions necessarily are always living uh, because people have to interpret them. We can't say, oh, what did Madison mean by this? Let's just do what Madison meant. Or what? Or that would be one originalist uh, 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 approach. Another originalist approach would be, well, what did people think the words meant in those days? But that, that doesn't get you anywhere. Because, you know, which people? I mean, and how do you know what they thought? Uh, it's, it's a hopeless thing. So uh, the, Constitu the Constitution was a political document. It was the product of compromise, right? You had many different views represented in the, in the convention. It wasn't just, uh, you know, a whole bunch of Madisons or a whole bunch of Hamiltons. They had different views. There were some anti-federalist types in, in the convention. Uh, George Mason, I think, was in the convention. Uh, so... It was they had to hammer out a compromise, and Hamilton and Madison did not go leave Philadelphia believing that the lines between the three branches of government or the lines between the federal government and the states had been defined clearly once and for all. They were under no such illusion. They knew those things were going to be fought out politically in the coming years. So a constitution, by definition, is living. So it's just it just seems uh, quixotic to say we have to fight this idea of a living constitution. Uh, I know uh, Thomas uh, Sowell is a big critic of living constitution. constitution. He once said, a living constitution is a dead constitution. Well, in a way, he's got a point. I mean, how does it, uh, uh, how can it, uh, it can't be a set of uh, fixed rules if it's subject to interpretation, but his, his mistake is in thinking there's some alternative. It's always going to be subject to interpretation. And any interpretation, uh, as uh, Wittgenstein put it, any interpretation is floating in the air alongside the rule that it's interpreting. Because then all we do is we shift the argument to what the interpretation means. We, we never can get out of this. So the, the Constitution cannot be, uh, this, this written Constitution cannot be some sort of anchor. And there's no way to, we sometimes think, people talk as if the Constitution, is, is there some computer somewhere 
that has the right interpretation of the Constitution programmed into it. And all we need to do is take any dispute, feed it in, and, and it can spit out the right thing to do. That's ridiculous. Any legal system is internal to the society. And, it, and it, it, it's not as if you can go to the, you know, the Wizard of Oz or something and saying, say, you know, what's the right thing to do under the Constitution? Uh, that's, a, that's impossible. And I think that, but I think that colors a lot of people's uh, uh, thinking about the Constitution and how the political system should work. Sheldon Richman is the executive editor of the Libertarian Institute, chairman of the Board of Trustees at the Center for a Stateless Society, and a contributing editor at antiwar.com. He writes a weekly column for the American Institute for Economic Research, and his latest books include America's Counter-Revolution, The Constitution Revisited, Separating School and State, Tethered Citizens, and Your Money or Your Life, Why We Must Abolish the Income Tax. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.